Hello everyone, this is Mr. Seymour. This chapter is going to discuss civil liberties, the protection of your individual rights. The first question we need to ask is why should we protect civil liberties? So let's look at some reasons and examples. It is a fair summary of constitutional history that the landmarks of our liberties have often been forged in cases involving not very nice people. And that's a quote from Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter. The protection of civil liberties and civil rights is most fundamental to our political values. It is the most fundamental political value in American society. Yet, as former Justice Frankfurter explained in the quote, the people who test liberties and rights in our courts are not always ideal citizens. And so let's consider some examples. The pickaxe murder, murderer on death row who finds God and asks for clemency. A publisher of magazines, books, and photos who's convicted of sending obscene materials through the United States mail, but relies on his First Amendment rights to do so. A convict whose electrocution is botched when 2,000 volts of electricity rush into his body, causing flames to leap from his head. The university student who's criminally charged for writing and publishing on the internet about torturing and murdering a woman, a, a thought crime without actually ever committing the crime. Travel around America and you're bound to run into the Constitution. It seems to be everywhere. Constitution. Our Constitution. The Constitution? You haven't read the Revised. Constitution. This little document, it means everything to us. It's like the Big Bang. It's the most momentous thing to happen in the modern world. The Constitution has been around for more than 225 years, but many of us don't have any idea what it says. Of course, that's never stopped us from arguing about what it means. I'm Peter Sagal, and I'm taking a journey across the country to find out how the Constitution works in the 21st century. We're blessed with freedom. We get to say whatever we want. But we just can't do it in secret. There is no secret. It's an illusion. Ask anybody in the street about the meaning of the Constitution, about the meaning of America itself, and they'll give you a one-word answer. Freedom. A guy once told me this is a free country. A free country. Free country. God damn it, this is a free country. But take a look at the Constitution. There are about 4,500 words in it, and freedom is not one of them. The delegates learned very quickly that they'd made a mistake. It would take the first 10 amendments to the Constitution to fix that little omission. But exactly what freedoms were guaranteed back then? And how free are we really today? The majority rules, or it should. One person's right can seem to another person like a great wrong. I feel like the Constitution failed me. I am so tweeting this right now. Yeah. And as the digital age changes how we live, can our rights keep up? The cracks are showing in the Bill of Rights, and I think technology is putting them there. This is the land of the free. That seems simple. Then why are our rights so complicated? A guy on a motorcycle. It's like freedom personified, right? Five guys on five motorcycles? Five times more freedom. It's a freedom fiesta. But freedom to do what, exactly? My friends here are the Arizona Leathernecks Motorcycle Club. They're all ex-Marines, even though they will tell you there is no such thing as an ex-Marine. The other night, I had some guy walk up to me and say, I want to yank on your goatee. <laughs> I just looked at him and said, you can try it. And then his friend grabbed him and was like, they were... I didn't People are actually dumb enough to get in your guys' faces. Oh, yeah. yeah. You'd be yeah. surprised. Wait, how often does that happen? Uh, Bar fights? Bar fights. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no shit. You guys are all Marines. When we talk about defending your country, is there some sort of ideal of America? A constitutional all idea. It's pretty all much all, all of the above. So we can keep our rights and liberties. Right. 
a lot of people don't realize the Bill of Rights weren't put in there to protect me from him right. or from you or anybody else. They were put in there to protect the individual citizen from the government. This is who we are. This right here. You have a copy of the Constitution in your pocket? Yes. You carry it with it at all times? Yes. Why? Because I believe in what it says, and there are so many people out there go, well, the Constitution says this. Oh, really? Where does it say that at? I love this fight. You're getting bar fights and constitutional arguments. One can be a preamble to the other. <laughs> <laughs> we are free. We are a free society. We should be able to make these choices ourselves. And if I choose not to wear a helmet and I get killed, yeah. bad on me. Well, what's the next thing that they're going to do? Are they going to make you put a leash on your kid? Talking, well, uh, it's great. You guys are hardcore. Wait, I didn't go spend two years in the Middle East away from my family, away from my friends, spend Christmases, everything else over there, to come back to a limited country? No, I did that for, come back to a free country. Right. So for these guys, your rights are absolute, including the right to get into a lot of trouble, if you are so inclined. That's what they fought for. And the Constitution is there to guarantee and protect those rights, and to keep anyone, especially the government, from taking them away. But what specific rights are covered by the Constitution? And how did those guarantees get there in the first place? Historian Rick Beeman knows something about this. We're discussing essential human rights the way the Founding Fathers would have done it, over a beer at Philadelphia's City Tavern. So this is City Tavern. This is very nice. Cheers. Oh, yeah. That really, that puts me in the yeah, mind. Yeah, and I, I think it probably put them in a much better frame of mind. They'd spent, you know, from... 10 o'clock in the morning till 3.30 or 4 in the state house. Then they came over here and relaxed, but they also kept talking. So among the things they didn't include, despite all the conviviality, was the Bill of Rights in the original Constitution. Well, why didn't they? I mean, it's well, kind of natural. Well, so they had lots of excuses. The states already have their Bills of Rights, so it would be redundant. Right. Uh, what if we leave out a few key rights? Uh, that would be dangerous. Right. Uh, but the real reason, I think, is they wanted to go home. They thought it might take another couple of months. So, so you're saying that the reason that we don't have or we didn't have a Bill of Rights in the original Constitution was that everybody was tired and grumpy and wanted to go home? Uh, well, I, I honestly, Peter, I think that's the, the main reason. And uh, once the Constitution went out to the public for ratification, uh, they learned very quickly that they'd made a mistake. After the delegates signed the draft constitution, it had to go out to the 13 states for ratification. But when the states started looking at it, there was a whole new round of debates with meetings and speeches and newspaper articles arguing pro and con back and forth. Good patriots like Patrick Henry of Virginia, that's the guy who said, give me liberty or give me death, were afraid that the new constitution with its strong central government would lead to the death of liberty. What was missing was a Bill of Rights to protect individual freedom. But here was the deal. The document couldn't be changed or amended by any state. They had to vote up or down, yay or nay, to approve the whole thing and make the Constitution the law of the land. There were all these states that said, OK, we'd be willing to do this if there were a Bill of Rights. And the pro-Constitution forces said, OK, as soon as you give us a Congress, the first thing we'll do is we'll give you a Bill of Rights. Is that more or less right? Most of the pro-Constitution folks said that. So the, the ratification was a popular vote in each it, it was as popular a vote as had ever occurred anywhere in the world. That didn't mean that women could vote yeah. or that slaves could vote. Uh, but literally all free adult males in most states black or white really could vote uh, it didn't matter whether you own property this really was a vote among we the people how did the specific rights that we now think of as the bill of rights how were they conceived how did, where do they come from so the constitution is finally ratified right. and really all of the rights come out of british encroachments on american liberties during the decade or more leading up to the revolution and there they are the bill of rights all ten amendments are framed as limits on the central government. They're nearly all written in negative terms. Congress shall make no law. 
Congress shall not. Instead of making promises, we set boundaries. Right at the start, the First Amendment includes the big three freedoms, freedom of religion, speech, and the press. Next comes the second with its well-regulated militia, or the right to keep and bear arms, depending on how you feel about that one. The Third Amendment is entirely devoted to protecting you from having government troops take up residence in your home. Can you imagine having redcoats coming in and raiding the refrigerator at three in the morning? The Fourth Amendment secures our freedom from unreasonable search and seizure. The Fifth protects you from being tried twice for the same charge or from being forced to testify against yourself. That's the familiar right to remain silent, the one that we invoke when we take the Fifth. The Sixth Amendment ensures a fair trial in criminal cases, speedy and public, and with a lawyer. The Seventh guarantees a jury trial in many civil cases. The Eighth Amendment protects against cruel and unusual punishment. Of course, what's cruel and what's unusual is left to the courts to decide. Flogging? No. Death? Maybe. Educational TV? Depends on the show. Some people worry that the importance of a list is as much what's not on it as what is on it. So the Ninth Amendment declares that just because certain rights are listed here, it doesn't mean that there are no others. And the Tenth Amendment says that the powers not specifically given to the government in the Constitution are reserved to the states and the people. To the founding generation of Americans, the greatest threat to individual liberty was the government they were creating. So even as they created it, they limited its powers. We have to link the Bill of Rights to the 14th Amendment in a process called selective incorporation. Now, the Bill of Rights was originally designed to be applied only to the states. So selective incorporation, which really didn't start taking place until the late 1890s, uses the 14th Amendment and its due process clause to prevent the states from abridging individual rights. Now, rather than just say, we're going to take the entire Bill of Rights and apply it to all of the states at the same time, they've taken, the court has taken a very careful case by case model. This model is called selective incorporation, where they choose the cases that they're going to apply, and it's been done slowly over time. But in order to use selective incorporation, they had, had to invoke the 14th Amendment. So without the 14th Amendment, you would not have the Bill of Rights applied to the states. In 1868, after the Civil War, Congress would go on to pass the 14th Amendment to the Constitution, which contains a clause that prevents states from making any law that limits the rights granted to citizens in the Constitution. This is an establishment clause. The amendment was designed to protect the rights of former slaves to things like life, liberty, and property, but it also was able to overrule the decision in Barron, and that led to the incorporation of rights granted in the Constitution into state law, regardless of whether or not the state had its own Bill of Rights, which all of them did. Now, I've um, taken the 14th Amendment and we'll go through it, but I've put some colors here. 
and in the first section I colored it or uh, red or pink all persons born or naturalized in the United States let's look at this word here all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof and you are subject to the jurisdiction the minute you're in US territory are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside this is birthright citizenship we'll talk a lot more about that a little later when we get into the next section but right now let's understand that is birthright citizenship so if you mess with this section we're going to be messing with another section here of the same 14th amendment that that really makes it difficult to apply the bill of rights and this is the part that's important no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States nor shall a state deprive any person of life liberty or property without due process of law this is called the due process clause nor shall it deny any to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the laws this is the equal protection clause now you notice that these are both in the same section of the 14th amendment so if you mess with section one what are we going to do here with section two and what happens to your civil liberties just want you to consider that now in section two of 14th of the 14th amendment it talks about apportionment representatives will be apportioned among several states according to their respective numbers counting the whole number of persons in each state not just three-fifths of, of a black man excluding Indians not taxed so we excluded Native Americans until later but when the right right to vote but when the right to vote at any election of the choice of electors for president and vice president of the United States representatives or Congress or the executive and judicial offices of a state or the members of the legislature thereof is denied to any look at this word male so who can vote males age 21 and over so women can't vote yet or in any way abridged except for participation in rebellion now if you participated in the Civil War we can keep you from um, voting we could um, or other crime now this other crime part means that in some states in many states if you are a convicted felon you can be denied your right to vote for a period of time or forever it depends on the state the basis of representation therein shall be reduced in the proportion which the number of such male citizens shall bear to the whole number of male citizens 21 years of age in each state so if you're forbidden to vote because of those conditions which were you participated in rebellion or you committed another crime generally a felony then they could forbid you from voting section three no person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector or president and vice president or hold any office civil or military under the United States or any other state who having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same meaning if you participated in the Civil War then we can keep you from holding office giving aid or giving aid or comfort to the enemies thereof but Congress may by a two-thirds vote remove such disability which it later did
Now, this, these are cases dealing with selective incorporation starting in 1897 with the Fifth Amendment and just compensation for eminent domain, which is your Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad versus the city of Chicago. 1925 is the first real case where a, a, one of the Ten Amendments is really applied in dealing with liberties, and that's freedom of speech. In 1925, it's get low. In 1931, it's the near versus Minnesota. And in the get low, this is where we get the uh, idea of clear and present danger, or what we call the screaming fire in a crowded fire uh, in a crowded theater test. Near versus Minnesota will will, will reduce some of those restrictions, but still uphold the fact that the states can enforce uh, certain laws that uh, that say if speech is um, of such a point at which it causes a clear and present danger, then it can be uh, punished. Uh, your Fifth Amendment right to counsel is Powell versus Arizona, but it only applies to capital cases. All right. In 1937, freedom of assembly, Dijon versus Arizona. 1940, First Amendment, a free exercise of religion, Cantwell, Connecticut. 1947, non-establishment of religion, Everson versus Board of Education. 1948, Sixth Amendment, right to a public trial in R.E. Oliver. 1949, Fourth Amendment, no reasonable, uh, unreasonable search and seizures is the case of Wolfie, Colorado. This is where we get fruit of the forbidden tree. First Amendment in 1958, freedom of association with the NAACP versus Alabama because they wanted to uh, break up the NAACP, Alabama did. And they said, no, you can't do that. 1962, the Eighth Amendment, no cruel and unusual punishment, Robinson v. California. 1963, First Amendment right to petition your government NAACP versus Button. 1963, Fifth Amendment right to counsel in felony cases. This is an incredibly important, important case. This is your Gideon versus Wainwright case. 1964, Fifth Amendment, immunity from self-incrimination is the Mallory versus Hogan case. You can look these cases up. We won't talk about all of them, just a few. Sixth Amendment in 1965, right to confront your witnesses is Pointer v. Texas. 1965, the 5th, the 9th, and others is your right to privacy, and that's Griswold. And um, this is one of the first cases of a right to privacy. Do you have a right to privacy behind your closed doors? 1966, the 6th Amendment, right to an impartial jury is Parker v. Gladden. 1967, 6th Amendment, right to a speedy trial, Klopfer v. North Carolina. 1969, the Fifth Amendment, immunity from double jeopardy, Benton versus Maryland. 1972, the Sixth Amendment, right to counsel in all crimes involving a jail term would be R. Singer versus Hamlin. If you can go to jail, you have the right to counsel. 2010, the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, the McDonald versus Chicago case. These are your incorporation cases. So, selective incorporation is first used in 1898, the Fifth Amendment and eminent domain. But then, uh, if this is the first real application of personal rights to states under the Bill of Rights is going to be get will versus the uh, state of New York. And uh, it says that states are bound by the First Amendment, but that they can restrict the speech on the basis of clear and present danger. 
and selective incorporation of fair trail, uh, trial rights is the focus of the 1960s. There's initial resistance to this by the Supreme Court. And then in the 1960s, we see more and more of it. Two of the most important cases you need to know are Miranda v. Arizona, your Miranda rights, and Gideon v. Wainwright, your right to counsel, otherwise known as Gideon's trumpet. Now let's look at rankings of civil liberties. The United States and Canada rank most as most free. Cuba ranks as least free. Yet we are now going to have diplomatic relations with Cuba, so we'll see how that works out in terms of human rights. Uh, Mexico's in the middle. Guatemala below Mexico, Russia just above China and Cuba. So let's look at the First Amendment. You have in, your, in the First Amendment freedoms of speech, press, assembly, and religion. Uh, these are your four most important basic freedoms. Freedom of speech, you are free to say almost any, almost, almost anything except what is obscene, slander is another person, or has a high probability of inciting others to take imminent lawless action. Freedom of the press, you're free to write or publish almost anything. Almost anything except that which is obscene, libels another person, seriously endangers military action or national security, or has a high probability of inciting others to do so, to take imminent lawless action. Freedom of assembly, you are free to assemble, but government may regulate the time and the place for reasons of public convenience and safety, so they can require you to get a permit. Providing such regulations are applied even-handedly to all groups. Now, can they f deny you that permit? No. You are protected uh, for religion from having religious beliefs forced upon you by others, or you are also free to believe what you like. So we call this freedom from and freedom of religion. So there are two basic freedoms when, with regard to religion, two basic freedoms with regard to religion. Let's look at freedom of expression. The early period had uncertain rights of the free uh, freedom of expression. For instance, the Sedition Act of 1798 and the Espionage Act of 1917 both basically were upheld and said, you don't have the freedom to, to speak out against your government, uh, not in reality. And then the Shank case in 1919 came before. This had to do with uh, uh, draft cards. And Shank was trying to tell people, he was a, an anarchist, and he told people to tear up their draft cards. And the courts found that by doing so, it formed a clear and present danger to U.S. security. And um, just or, uh, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes said, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. And he said that was like yelling fire in a crowded theater by inciting violence. So you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. The modern period was protect, uh, protecting free expression. The early Cold War saw the McCarthy era. Freedom of speech was abridged in the interest of national security, protected after the 1950s when we saw the debacle of, of, of Eugene McCarthy. So imminent lawless action test. As an example, you can say, let's go to the ROTC building and protest, but you cannot say, let's burn down the ROTC building. So as a recent example, the family of, um, of uh, the young Brown boy in, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, uh, Michael Brown's stepdad yelled, we gonna burn this place down. And by doing so, he was inciting a riot and he was charged. Um, they've dropped the charges uh, in deference for him because they don't want to cause an even bigger problem, but he was detained and anybody that followed him or said that we're going to burn this place down was detained because that is inciting violence. Now, symbolic speech is protected, but less completely than verbal speech. So symbolic is gestures, signs, things like that. We'll look at that.
but in the case of Morse versus Frederick, we found kind of the opposite. This is the most, this is the bong hits for Jesus case. Morse v. Frederick, students were allowed to go across the street from the school they were encouraged to during school time to view the Winter Olympic torch as it went by in 1998. Several students unfurled a large white banner saying bong hits for Jesus. The principal suspended the students involved, including a student named Joseph Frederick. The case was taken to the Supreme Court. Frederick argued freedom of expression, symbolic speech. The school argued a need to promote student safety and anti-drug policies. The court found that student safety and the ability to enforce anti-drug policies took precedence over students' rights to freedom of expression. Libel and slander. Libel is publishing material that's false, so libel is printing. Slander is spoken words. If it's a public official, it requires malicious intent, reckless endangerment, reckless disregard of the truth. When we get to religion, we have first the Establishment Clause, which says that government cannot establish a religion or allow the establishment of religion. It may not favor one religion over another. It may not favor uh, one religion over no religion. And it may, and it has to call, uh, have a wall of separation versus excessive entanglement. Mr. Jefferson's expression, wall of separation between church and state, was something that he wrote in a private letter to the Danbury Baptist. And this certainly reflected Jefferson's opinion of the relationship between church and state, but it, it was by no means shared by everyone within the founding generation. I think that James Madison uh, agreed with Jefferson to a large extent about, uh, about what the relationship between church and sta state meant. But nonetheless, there were some subtle differences between them. And for one example, uh, every administration through to Madison issued a uh, proclamation of, um, of setting aside a day of prayer and fasting. And for Madison, he actually had a certain amount of misgivings about that. He wasn't sure that was most appropriate, but it was wartime and a lot of people were calling it, calling for it. And he thought that this was a way of putting the, the uh, country at rest. And he was very deliberate in the way that he phrased it to show that there was no coercive element whatsoever. This was merely recommendation from the executive office. But when Jefferson was in office, he thought that such proclamations were inappropriate for any government official. And so that's one difference between Jefferson and Madison. Now, since the 1960s, freedom of religion and the Establishment Clause has often involved something called the Lemon Test. And the Lemon Test is three parts. Number one, the policy must have a non-religious purpose. Number two, its primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. The policy must not foster an excessive entanglement of government with religion. Those three things must be met. So we'll look at that in just a second. Now, when you get to the free exercise clause, 
the government is prohibited from interfering with the practice of religion. Government interference is allowed when the exercise of religious belief conflicts with otherwise valid law. So um, if you're a Wiccan, are you allowed to have some kind of a blood sacrifice? If you uh, are a member of the Church of the Ganja, are you allowed to smoke marijuana publicly in the name of religion? The answer is no. But they may not prohibit the free exercise of religion. With Lemon v. Kurtzman, the Supreme Court announced a three-part test that it would use in determining the government's action. And this is to determine whether or not there was a violation of the Establishment Clause. At issue in the case were uh, the laws of two states, which were the laws of Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, that prohibited, uh, provided financial support to non-public religious elementary and secondary schools. In each case, state support for teacher salaries, textbooks, and materials were justified because the funding was provided only for the teaching of secular subjects taught in the schools. The laws of both states were challenged on the grounds that they established a religion in violation of the First Amendment. So under our system, the choice has been made that government is to be entirely excluded from the area of religious instruction and church excluded from the area affairs of government. This is your separation of church and state. This is the wall that we talk about. The wall of separation. The Constitution says that religion must be a, a private matter for the individual, the family, and the institutions of private choice. And that while some involvement, some involvement and entanglement are inevitable, that lines must be drawn. So where are the lines drawn? In its decision, the three-part test, now referred to as the Lemon Test, to determine when government involvement in religious becomes establishment or promotion. For our national, uh, for a national or state law to meet the requirements of the Lemon Test, it must first have a clear secular legislative purpose. So for instance, if I give excess, uh, excess math books to uh, a school, a private school, a religious school, I say, hey, here's math books that we have left over. That's not entanglement because the government's not promoting religion. They're not religious books. But if we were to provide Bibles, that's a whole other thing. In other words, its goals must be non-religious in nature. Second, the primary effect must be that neither it neither advances nor inhibits religion. The third is that any excessive government entanglement with religion must be evil avoided. So the difficulty in meeting these standards set forth in this test is that if a law fails to meet any one of those requirements, it is unconstitutional. And this gets very tricky. So let's look at the lemon test, acceptable versus unacceptable forms. Can free bus transportation be provided if both public and private school students get the transportation? Yes. Can non-denominational textbooks be given? English books, math books, social studies books that do not promote religion? Yes. Can aid for buildings at colleges and universities be provided by the federal government? Yes. But um, it cannot supplement a teacher's salary, cannot pay tuition or rebates for elementary or secondary schools. This part, though, is coming under a lot of um, change, and, and uh, the use of vouchers is, is becoming something that is becoming legal. Money for equipment or supplies that would promote um, the school's religious purpose. Lastly, and the most recent case with regard to, um, to religion has been Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. The Supreme Court in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby was asked to, lobby, was asked to consider whether or not a for-profit company that was family owned could be forced to provide family planning and contraception as part of its health insurance as required under Obamacare. And the court defined the question as follows. Does the Religious Freedom Restoration Act of 1993 allow for a not for a, a, a for-profit company to deny its employees health coverage of contraception 
to which employees would otherwise be entitled based on religious objections of the company's owners and the Supreme Court in a very narrow decision said yes. The court said that Congress had intended the RFRA to be read as applying to corporations since they are composed of individuals and act as individuals who use them to achieve a desired end. Because the contraception requirement forces religious corporations to fund what they consider abortion, which goes against their stated religious principles, or to face fines, it creates a substantial burden that interferes with the practice of government, not the least restrictive method of satisfying the government's interests. In fact, it is a less restrictive method in the form of the Department of Health and Human Services exemption for nonprofit religious organizations, which the Hort court held can and should be applied to for-profit corporations such as Hobby Lobby. Now, this law was supposed to be there so that um, churches could avoid having to provide contraception to um, their employees. The court held that in this ruling that it only applies to the contracept mandate, contraceptive mandate rather than to all possible objections to affordable care, and it applies only to family-owned companies not yet to large stakeholding companies like Exxon. Now, here's the question. Can Hobby Lobby or another company start to take this with regard to same-sex marriages and recognizing benefits for same-sex couples, providing a birthday or a wedding cake, so forth? We'll see what happens. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was afraid Everyone, I'm Devin Dwyer in New York. It's decision day at the Supreme Court, and there was a big one. The justices just issued a landmark ruling on religious freedom and Obamacare. The family-owned craft store chain Hobby Lobby claimed it shouldn't have to pay for contraception for its employees as part of the Affordable Care Act. They said it would violate the company's religious beliefs, and today the justices agreed. ABC's Terry Moran, who's been covering the court for more than 20 years, is outside the Supreme Court. Terry, thank you for being here. A narrowly divided court today. What did the majority say? Well, it was narrowly divided and in many ways, Devin, narrowly written. What the majority here said is that for-profit, closely held, family-owned, basically, corporations can claim religious freedom. The corporation itself can have religious freedom uh, in order to uh, opt out of the Obamacare mandate that they provide employees with contraceptives that they believe violate their religious conscience, the morning after pill, Plan B, Ella, that they believe are equivalent to abortion. So what the court has said essentially is that for these corporations, not Exxon, not General Motors, not giant corporations, but for these family-owned corporations, corporations are people. As Mitt Romney said, here, here's what Justice Samuel Alito, in his opinion, said, a corporation is simply a form of organization used by human beings to achieve desired ends. When rights, whether constitutional or statutory, are extended to corporations, as they're doing in this opinion, uh, the purpose is to protect the rights of these people. So the majority here saying that the burden on the religious conscience of the owners of Hobby Lobby, who are devout Southern Baptists, the owners of Conestoga, who are Mennonites, is just too great that, that in this case, corporations are people. Well, the dissent, uh, written by Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Justice Ruth G Bader Ginsburg, warns of a parade of horribles coming down the road. She says, in a decision of startling breadth, the court holds today that commercial enterprises, including corporations, along with partnerships and sole proprietorships, can opt out of any law they judge incompatible with their sincerely held religious beliefs. That what Justice Ginsburg is raising is the prospect of a lot of people, uh, whether they're Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, Wiccan, Druid, coming down the pike and saying, this particular regulation, this particular law, burdens my religious freedom. And that is an open question, how this opinion will play out in the years to come. Terry, I want to talk to you about this. Moving on to the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. This is a widely accepted view that the Second Amendment blocked the federal government from abolishing state militias. In the District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008, the court ruled 
Second Amendment protects an individual right to possess a firearm, period. In McDonald v. Chicago in 2010, the court further extended the 2008 decision to apply to all state and local governments, thus incorporating thus incorporating the Second Amendment. On that issue but maybe um, so here's a list of due process protections this is your rights as you're accused of a crime you have search and seizure protections you're protected from unreasonable searches and seizures under the Fourth Amendment but you can forfeit that right if you knowingly waive it or if you've signed that way a waiver on the basis of for instance being on probation or parole you are protected from arrest unless authorities have probable cause to believe that you have committed a crime. Fifth Amendment, self-incrimination. You're protected against self-incrimination, and that means that you have the right to remain silent and to, you, to be protected against coercion by law enforcement. You have the right against double jeopardy. You cannot be tried twice for the same crime if the first trial results in a verdict of innocence and they're at the same level. So uh, if you're tried for a crime at the state level and then you're tried on a federal crime, is that double jeopardy? And the answer is no, you can be crime, tried for both. Due process, you cannot be deprived of life, liberty, or property without proper legal proceedings. That's the 14th and 5th Amendments. Your Sixth Amendment right. Counsel, you have the right to be represented by, represented by an attorney and can demand to speak first with an attorney before you respond to questions. You have the right to prompt and reasonable proceedings, a fair and speedy trial. You have the right to be arraigned promptly, to be informed of the charges, to confront your witnesses, and to have a speedy and open trial by an impartial jury. Your Eighth Amendment right bail you are protected against excessive bail or fines cruel and unusual punishment you're protected from cruel and unusual punishment but this provision does not protect you from the death penalty or from a long prison term for a minor offense so let's talk first about procedural due process you go through certain procedures, suspension, uh, suspicion, accusation, and so forth. Procedural due process are the procedures that authorities must follow before they can lawfully punish you for an offense. And so you start with the suspicion phase. You can't be searched unless there's probable cause that a crime has committed. Or you have a warrant, which is where, how you get your warrant, Fourth Amendment. 
it is not a blanket protection. There are some warrantless searches that are allowed based on the situation. For instance, um, if a policeman stops you and sees uh, and smells marijuana in your vehicle, does he have the right to detain you until we can get someone to search your car? Yes. Until we can get the warrant? Yes. He has probable cause. A recent case, though, Florida versus Hardinas that I'm going to go to in just the next. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you do or say can be used. Um, what's the next part? As a flotation device. As a flotation device. Most of us have heard the phrase Miranda rights or warnings through movies or TV shows. But did you ever wonder about the real story behind it? Miranda rights were established in 1966, following the court case of Miranda versus Arizona. Ernesto Miranda was arrested after he was charged with kidnapping and rape. After hours of police interrogation, he signed a confession, but his conviction was overturned because he was never informed of his rights before the questioning began. And from there on, Miranda warnings were established to make suspects aware of their rights when they are arrested. Miranda warning guidelines state, a suspect must be told that they have the right to remain silent. Anything the suspect says is admissible in court. And lastly, they have the right to an attorney, and one is assigned to them if they cannot afford one. The Miranda warnings are taken so seriously in law enforcement that if the suspect speaks a different language or is deaf, an interpreter or other alternative methods are used to explain the rights. Some jurisdictions require a police officer to ask the suspect if they understand their rights after every sentence. Other countries have their own versions, some more detailed, like in France where suspects are also made aware of their rights to see a doctor. 
As for Ernesto Miranda, he was later retried and convicted. Sometime after his prison sentence, he was stabbed to death in a bar. Now, the exclusionary rule, also called fruit of the forbidden tree, says that there is no admission of an illegally obtained piece of evidence. And the 1960s expansion of the exclusionary rule talks about inevitable discovery and good faith as being the only reasons why um, you can avoid a warrant. So if you come to a crime and the guy's holding the knife in his hand, that's inevitable discovery.
uh, again, rights of persons accused of crimes, crime punishment and police practices, Supreme Court's ruling of effective police practices, as in Miranda versus Arizona. Here's your Miranda warning. Some poor or arbitrary application of rights, the use of racial profiling, tough sentencing policies, especially mandatory sentencing, and prison overcrowding. These are incarceration rates by state, those in red here, or orange, or whatever color you want to call that, 700 or more, that puts Texas there. Um, those in the blue have less than 500 per 100,000. So we have over 700 per 100,000 residents. It's almost one in a thousand of us that are in this state that are in, imprisoned. The United States has a higher incarceration rate per, per 100,000 than any other country, uh, modern country, at 716. And that's even more than Cuba and Russia and Iran, which are very, um, they're not democratic countries. This is the rising prisoner population. Now, why did it start to rise right around in here? Mandatory sentencing, Sentencing Reform Act of 1984. Mandatory drug sentencing caused a huge increase in the federal prisoner population. Americans embrace freedom of expression in it as an abstract virtue, and we believe that we are all free to express ourselves and that we live in a free country. But we also favor limits on freedom of expression in particular cases. Remember, there's a balance between one person's rights and another's. So who do we go to in order to try to correct imbalances? We we look to the judicial system as the primary protector of individual rights. Benjamin Franklin said that he who would trade liberty for some temporary security deserves neither liberty nor security. And I think he was looking forward to today 
he may not have seen exactly how we live today or the technology that we live in, but he realized that there will always be that sacrifice or that temptation to sacrifice uh, a little bit of liberty for the promise of security.